Hello, everybody. Hopefully, you can all hear me okay. And I'd like to welcome you all along to this evening's lecture. Uh, Martin Byrne is back with us uh, for his second lecture. Um, Martin joined us uh, a couple of weeks ago to talk about Father Michael Flanagan, a uh, Republican priest based up in Sligo area. And now he's actually back to tell us about the first love of his life. So he's actually more of um, uh, uh, a fan of older history rather than the War of Independence. So Martin works for the OPW. Uh, he's a guide in uh, Carmore. He's a historian. He's a musician. And he's joining us all the way from Sligo tonight to talk about astronomical observations at Stone Age sites. So without further ado, I'll hand you over. Welcome, Martin. Liam, thank you very much. Uh, hello everybody and um, thanks for having me back again. And for the next hour or so, I'm going to be taking you, I suppose, on a virtual tour of some sites in County Sligo and some sites in County Meath. And what we're going to be looking at are monuments called passage graves or um, chambered cairns. So, essentially, I'm just starting off here, you can see I've got mainly pictures I have here, so lots of interesting pictures to look at anyway. And essentially what we have here is a cave in the woods in Sligo. And it's probably the most accessible cave in County Sligo. It's the cave in Cairns Hill, which is just about uh, one kilometre out of Sligo town. And there's a huge monument on the summit just above this cave. But the point that I'm making here is that a lot of these Stone Age monuments we'll be talking about in this lecture. Uh, in the past, they used to be coal caves. And a lot of Stone Age monuments really are artificial caves. And when you look at Stone Age monuments in County Sligo, particularly passage graves, you almost always discover that they are located near caves. So it's limestone country. So this small cave we have here anyway is the cave in Cairns Hill. And the caves are very, very fascinating and very interesting places. Entrances, you could say, to the other world. So my second picture here is of, this is the cave of, one of the caves of the caves of Keshkaran in County Sligo. Now Keshkaran is a mountain outside Ballymoat and it has 21 caves in the mountain and it has a passage grave up on the summit. It's on the western edge of the Brickleaf complex or the Carrowkeel complex. And years ago when I got interested in this topic um, I came up to visit this area and camped in the caves um, on an equinox, I think in the mid 1990s. And this photograph here on the left is of a sunset and the sun was shining into the cave. And there was an incredible big long beam of sunlight shining into that cave. So I was very struck by that at the time, that these, um, these natural kind of openings in mountains or entryways into mountains, that they function pretty much the same way as monuments like Newgrange do. And at certain times of the year, they are lit by beams of light from the sun or from the moon. So that's the sun shining into one of the caves there, the caves of Kesh. And the picture here on the right is an illustration by Arthur Rackham. Now this is not going to be all astronomy during this talk. There's a lot of other bits and pieces to it as well. But this is um, the caves of Kesh. Um, there's a major story, the enchanted caves of Kesh Corn, where Finn McCool and the Fina are lured into the caves by the three witches who live in there. And the witches transform them into old men. They tie them up with um, magic wool and uh, transform them into old men. And that's quite a common theme, as you'll hear, that you discover around these kind of sites as well. Definitely places of transformation. So anyway, that's the caves of Kesh Karn in County Sligo. Now, this is a picture of a monument, uh, which is just outside Sligo town, and it's called Mahara Boy. And it wouldn't be that well known in Ireland. It really deserves to be a lot better known. It was discovered um, around 2004, 2005, when they were building the Sligo Bypass. And it's a thing called a causeway enclosure. So essentially this ring that you can see here is about five and a half acres in extent. And there's a ditch dug around the outside. And this, you can see the segments here. And then there's a causeway interrupting the ditch. So this is why they're called causeway enclosures. There's different entrances into them. And about three meters back from the ditch, you have this timber fence running right around the outside. And that's all built out of oak. Now, what's so unusual about this monument that was discovered when they were building the new road around Sligo is, Causeway enclosures are fairly rare in Ireland. I think we only have maybe five or six of them known at the moment. There's about 70 of them in Ireland and in England um, in total. So there's some quite famous ones in England like Cadbury Castle and Windmill Hill. But what's unique about Mahara Boy is it's currently the oldest of all the dated causeways enclosures in the country. And this has a date of something like 4150 BC, they started to build this monument here. So it's unique in Ireland and in England because it is the oldest that is currently known. 
And this is giving us a bit of an arrival date for some Stone Age farmers uh, who arrive in the Sligo area. So that's the Causeway enclosure in Maharaboy. I'll be talking a bit more about that in a few minutes. Um, it's a kind of a dense enough subject and I'm not going to go into too much detail about any of it, but um, there has been a lot of new research done in the last couple of years about the people who build these um, type of monuments, the Stone Age farmers who build them. And this research started in 2015. There was DNA was taken from the skeleton of a woman who was found in a monument just outside Belfast, at a place called Balnahati. And from this DNA um, up in Trinity College, they were able to reconstruct her genetic information, basically. So we can be fairly sure now that these farmers, these people who are arriving from the continent, um, in the Sligo region, they arrive in large numbers around 6,000 years ago. We believe that they're coming from the Brittany region in France, but their ultimate origins are Anatolia in Turkey, about seven, eight, maybe 9,000 years ago. And these are the first people to domesticate crops and to domesticate um, animals. And these farmers, these passage grave people, as we call them, migrate through the Mediterranean. They move into the, the, you find a lot of these monuments in France and in Spain. And then you find Ireland and England are colonized from roughly around 6,000 years ago. So we have a lot of information now, basically, about the people who build these monuments. And you can look her up online. There's quite a bit more information about her. The Ballinahattie woman, she's the first um, Stone Age person whose um, genomes were sequenced. There's been quite a bit more of it done since then. I'll tell you a bit more about her as we go along anyway. It's a very important part of the story. Now that causeway enclosure, um, when it was excavated, this is the type of artifacts that you would find in these type of monuments. They were making arrowheads, they were making spearheads, they were making knives and various different things out of either flint or out of chert. And one of the reasons that these Stone Age farmers seem to be coming to Sligo is there's a great source of um, chert to be found in the area. Chert is kind of like, almost like, it's harder than flint, but it's also more brittle. But you find a lot of tools made out of chert and flint in these monuments. And also in the causeway enclosure, there were three of these um, stone axes found. Uh, two of them had been smashed or broken and placed in the, um, the ditch around the causeway. So these are quite symbolic and they seem to have been intentionally broken and um, buried. Now this is Carrowmore, where I work, um, which is just two miles outside Sligo town. Um, it's in the middle of a peninsula, the Coolera Peninsula. And you can see the spire of Sligo Cathedral is just here. It's about two miles from us. And you can see this is the hill of Maharaboy where the causeway enclosure is found. So it's just outside Sligo town. Sorry, there, I didn't mean to move on. So what you find at Carrowmore is it's the largest and the oldest collection of these type of monuments that we call passage graves. So we have a date from the causeway enclosure of these people arriving on the west coast of Ireland. It's very interesting that they come from Brittany right up the west coast as far as the Sligo region. And you don't find, you do find these monuments in other counties, but you don't find the kind of concentrations of them that you find in County Sligo. You wouldn't find them in other counties. And also we have some very early examples of these monuments here in County Sligo as well. So Carrowmore, the way is laid out basically, it covers almost a square kilometre of ground. You have a huge monument at the centre and you have about 40 monuments around the outside. And it's just about two miles from Sligo town. So like I say, you can actually see the spire of the cathedral in the town from Carrowmore. Now these are the type of monuments that you find in Carrowmore. So we call, they're an early form of passage grave. And you can see this ring of stones here, which is running around the outside of the monument. Within your ring of stones, you have a raised platform. So the interior of that circle is about a meter above the surrounding ground level outside. At the center of your platform, you have a communal burial chamber. And this is the only cross-shaped or cruciform chamber here in Carrowmore. This is number 27, which is the largest of the monuments. And then you have a remains of a passageway, which is leading out of the burial chamber here as well. So these are the type of monuments that we find at Carrowmore. They're an early form of passage grave. And essentially, this is the same type of monument as you're looking at when you look at Newgrange. So at the central monument is in here, number 51 or Listahl. And then you have 40 of these monuments right around the outside. And something I have found from giving tours at Carrowmore is that the whole place is quite possibly seems to be a model of a monument because you have your 40 or so stone circles running around the outside of the plateau at Carrowmore, and you generally have 30 to 40 stones in a circle. You have your chamber at the centre, your, your burial chamber, and we have one main monument here at the centre of Carrowmore. So it's one thing that has occurred to me, the whole place seems to be almost like a map, or a model of a monument, possibly a model of a monument on the continent where these farmers came from. So, 
there's a typical Caramore dolmen. There are a drawing of a Caramore dolmen, and this is by this chap up here on the right. That's Charles Elcock, who was one of the early researchers who came to Caramore. And this drawing is uh, this watercolor is from 1882. He's cheating a little bit here because um, he's made this person standing in front of the monument much smaller than he should be. He'd only be about three feet high if it's done to scale. That monument is much smaller than it appears in this photo, this, this illustration here. And the other gentleman here you can see in the background is George Petrie, and he's sorry, the, the godfather of Irish archaeology. He'd be the person who came to Carrow Moor in 1837 with the Ordnance Survey and he surveyed the monuments for the first time and uh, he mapped them for the first time as well. So these would be two of the gentlemen who did a lot of research at Caramore. Elcock um, named this stone here, or gave it his nickname. It's called the Kissing Stone. And it's on one of only three monuments in Caramore with an old name. Now, this is the central monument at Caramore. It also has a name, it's called Lis Tahu. And uh, this central monument, we find when we're giving tours, it can be hard enough to explain because it's the most complex monument at Caramore, but it is also, it has been restored by the OPW. So we're not 100% sure what it looked like originally, but essentially at the center of Caramore, you have a huge platform, which is 50 meters in diameter, and that made the oldest part of Caramore. You have the largest stone circle within that platform. It's about 35 meters in diameter. Um, at the centre of that stone circle, you have this large chamber here, and this is covered by a huge flag of stone, about nine metres to a side. So this is a huge kind of table of stone here, and it's propped up on the sides. It's tipped up at an angle, and it's six degrees above horizontal. So this is the focal monument, or the central monument at Caramore. Now, when this monument was built originally, like all of the other monuments at Caramore, it would have been freestanding. So there was no pile of stones around it. And it's now known that the monuments at Caramore never had cairns around them, like the later monuments like Newgrange or Queen Nave's Cairn. The Caramore monuments were always freestanding, except for this monument here. When it was excavated back in the late 1990s, they discovered that there was a cairn of stones around up at least the height of the roof. So it's thought that this monument was freestanding for a period of time. And then at some later stage, after possibly two or 300 years, it was buried within some kind of a pile of stones. Now it had been used as a quarry since the 16th century. So when it was restored, they used this kind of mound of gabions around it to restore it. So it's somewhat controversial, but anyway, that's the main or the focal or the central monument in Caramore. And of the 40 or so smaller monuments, and you can see one of those here to the right, these early Horn passage graves, whenever they have a passageway surviving, that passageway is generally pointing back towards this central monument here. So Caramore is like a huge wheel with your 40 monuments running around the outside or the rim. And then they point back towards this monument here, which would be the hub at the center. Now, just while we're talking about that, um, just to mention briefly, the Swedish archeologists who excavated at Caramore, they were led by Professor Goran Bjornholt. And he was convinced that the Caramore monuments were the oldest monuments in Europe. And he was pushing this quite strange model, I suppose, really that um, farming developed on the west of Ireland before it developed in other places. But now we have so much new information from DNA and things like that, so we can say for sure that's not quite the case. But anyway, one of the interesting things was Professor Buren Holt was back again publishing some stuff last year uh, about DNA. And this is a photograph of a monument here about two kilometres from Caramore, and it's called Primrose Grange. And it's a different type of monument, a court cairn or a court tomb, built by a different group of farmers. But what is so interesting is that they found a connection between our central monument at Carrow Moor and this different type of monument here at Primrose Grange. Because from the genetics, they were able to say that some of the children of it, and there was, there, I, should only, I should mention there were only seven people buried in the chamber of this monument here in Carrow Moor, between five and seven people. But in these smaller monuments here, you find generally something like maybe 40 to 50 cremated bodies in the smaller monuments around the outside of Caramore. But here at the centre, there was between five and seven people. Now, Caramore was trashed or it was kind of opened or it was excavated by Roger Walker, who was a local landlord in the 1830s and the 1840s, who had no interest in human remains. Uh, he was looking for gold, which he did find in Caramore. So in general, there's a poor record of human remains at Caramore because Roger Walker cleaned out the burial chambers and threw the human remains around outside. So when our central chamber here was excavated, the human remains were found scattered around outside the monument here. 
but these were unburnt bones. So the archaeologists were able to take some genetic material from them. And they discovered that a 23 year old gentleman who was buried in this central monument here, some of his children were buried in this monument here, Primrose Grange, about two, two kilometers to the west of us. So it's interesting to find this link between these two different groups of farmers in two different types of monuments quite so close by. So that was published last year anyway, that, uh, that paper about Primrose Range. Now to get into the astronomy about what goes on here. This is the central monument again at Caramore, the hub of the whole place. So it's the largest of the burial chambers and it's the only one that is covered by this huge slab of stone. Now some of the guides working at Caramore figured out about 15 years ago what was going on. Around the time that the monument was restored here, they discovered that there is what seems to be an astronomical alignment at this monument. So you can see that the capstone is tipped at an angle. It's six degrees above horizontal. So the front of it is raised higher than the back of it and it's pointing towards the mountains. And what happens is around the end of October, around the 31st of October, at the monument you can see here to the, on the left hand photograph, you can see this restoration where they had this large cairn to it, but the axis of the monument is pointing out along this line and it's pointing to a lake up in the summit of the mountain up there. These are the Ballygawley Mountains and we have more monuments on the summits up there. So essentially when the sun rises at this position over the lake of the two geese up in the mountain, the beam of sunlight is captured inside the dolmen and you can see this lovely golden light appears on the underneath of the capstone. That's what the sun looks like as it's just appearing over the mountain. Quite amazing when you see it. Um, and that's what it looks like inside the chamber. So the only reason that this can happen is because the capstone is tipped at this angle of six degrees above horizontal. You get this beautiful beam of golden light on the underneath of the capstone and then this freestanding blocking stone in the doorway casts this pointer of shadow. So you get a fairly significant indication telling you when the cross quarter day, which we now call Halloween or Samhain, is coming in early November, and also the modern St. Bridget's Day as well, with the cross quarter day um, in Bullock as well. So this monument is lined up to both of those events. Now there is a piece of megalithic art carved on the edge of this capstone here, which is very hard to see with your naked eye, but there is a circle and there are a set of hoops carved on the edge of this stone, a little bit of Stone Age art. And I have just taken the piece of Stone Age art and I have just superimposed it over the mountains that we're looking towards here. So here's where the sun rises on the 31st of October. This is where the Witch's Lake is up on the top of the mountains. And then you have monuments on each of these summits up here in the Ballygawley Mountains. It always seems to me, giving these tours at work, that this carving on the edge of the dolmen may actually be a carving of these mountains. And this circle with the dot you see over here may be the sun rising out of the lake up on the mountains. This is a picture of the same mountains from about two or three kilometers to the east from the summit of Cairns Hill. So you can see this is the mountains here. This is what we call the Witch's House. This is um, Anamore, this is, sorry, Sleeve Ain. There's Anamore and there's um, the lake over here, Anamore and Sleeve Bergen. There's four cairns up on the summit of these mountains. But one thing you notice when you're standing up here on Cairns Hill, looking due south to the mountains, which are only about four kilometers away, is you actually have the form of a woman lying in the mountain area. You have a face, you have a breast, you have a belly, and you have a hand. These are the same mountains that you're looking at here from Caramore, but you're looking at them from a different angle. And the guides at Caramore tend to call this the body of the witch or the old woman, because there is a witch's house up here on the mountain. Whereas when you're looking at it from this angle, you're looking at the younger version of the witch. And again, I did mention at the start, these places are places of transformation. And one thing that you find a lot of, or you find a lot of stories about the witches, and these witches either transform men like Finn McCool and the Fina into old men, they take away their youth, or they go for a swim themselves in their enchanted lake and they will transform themselves into young women. So that's quite a common motif you find at these monuments. This is the witch's house. Um, this is the cairn that's up on the top. This is the cairn that is sitting up here, I suppose you would say, on the breast uh, in the mountains here. That is the cairn here. So this is Kalia Kavira's house and it's the only one of these monuments in the Ox Mountains that's open that people can climb into. There's a, a chamber in there, it's a, a kind of a, a passage grave. And in all of the local folklore around um, Sligo, this witch, this lady, um, she's called Garibok in Sligo actually, the same as the river. And she's the lady who's credited with building all of the monuments in Sligo. So our witch in Sligo, she lives up in the mountain in her house here. She has a magic cow 
Um, sometimes she has a deer in some of the stories as well. But the one thing you always find in these stories is she's the lady who builds all of the monuments. So she carries the rocks down from the mountains to Carol Moore in her white apron, and then she scatters the rocks around the landscape. This is the story that you generally find, the folk story that goes with these kind of sites. So that's the witch's house up in the mountains. That's the cairn that I'm standing on, um, actually looking at those, those last two views. So this is Cairns Hill in Sligo, which is an unopened monument. Sligo has got a huge amount of these unopened Stone Age monuments. This one here is about, um, I think it's about 30, 45 metres in diameter. And there is actually an indication of where the entrance is here because some people were digging at some stage in the past and there are some large slabs to be seen here. But this is an, an unopened Stone Age monument in Sligo, of which there are many. And that's where the view is, where I'm standing, looking at the mountains here. I'm standing on the top of that cairn um, on Cairns Hill. So that's the view. If I look to the south, I'm looking at the Ballygawley Mountains and you can see the goddess, I suppose, lying in the mountain. And if you look to the west, you're looking over towards Nocknaray and Queen Maeve's Cairn, which is about eight kilometres away. Nocknaray is just an amazing site. The cairn here is about 60 metres in diameter. It's absolutely huge. And it's one of seven monuments on the mountain. There's another cairn up here on the top. There's a hut site here, and there's a few more smaller monuments here. So this is another huge unopened monument. We have two on Cairns Hill, and we have one on Nocknaray, which have never been opened. Um, this, is, by the way, is the quarry, um, which is where the stones were dug to build this huge, huge Queen Maeve's Cairn from. So back to Cairns Hill. We're standing up on the summit of this cairn on Cairns Hill. It's on the equinox at sunset and you're looking across to this very distinctive profile of Nocknaray and that's our Queen Maeve's Cairn again, 60 metres in diameter on the summit and down here in the Midlands you have Carrow Moor. So you have Cairns Hill, you have Carrow Moor and you have Nocknaray. Now there are all kinds of alignments between all of these monuments. Like you can see from this picture here, you don't have to be sitting inside a chamber like there was in Carrow Moor, looking out at the sun rising. You can be sitting on top of the monument and you can be watching the sun rising or setting over another monument or a mountain as well. And Sligo is full of these kind of alignments. Um, this is up on top of Nocknaray as well. There's a north marker stone, they call it, and a south marker stone on Nocknaray. And this here is the, the north marker stone, the big flat stone. But Nocknaray, means various different things to different people. It's the hill of the king, the hill of the queen, the hill of the slaughter, the hill of executions. But when I was in school, one of the words we learned, from the, one of the old words in Irish for the moon is ray as well. So not ray can be the hill of the moon as well. But whatever else it is, it's an amazing platform. It's got this amazing large flat summit and it's got an incredible view of the horizon. So this is just one day I was up there about 10 or 12 years ago and was up there for the moonrise. And what it has around the horizon as well is you have all of these notches and bumps, which are what you would need to have if you were going to try and observe the cycles of the sun and the cycles of the moon and make some kind of sense. Of now, just before I go on, to just try and put some of that information into context, we're fairly sure that these Stone Age farmers are coming from the Brittany region in France. And we have quite a few indications of why they're coming. And the sea levels are rising in Brittany at that time, about six, six and a half thousand years ago. Um, the sea levels are rising quite rapidly in the Gulf of Morbihan. Um, you find a lot of these type of monuments over there. Um, you find kind of smaller versions of these monuments, I suppose, but there are quite a few early passage graves over in that region. But essentially there was a lot of overcrowding going on in Brittany at that time. So that's why we're seeing groups of farmers um, leaving and coming to settle in Ireland and in England. Um, and one of the fascinating things about this is we know that they're bringing livestock with them. Because one of the things that we have at Carrowmore that we use to date the monuments in Carrowmore are one of the things you often find in these burial chambers are pieces of red deer antler. And they were used to redate Carol Moore, the Carrowmore monuments in 2012. And we have a range of dates now for Carrowmore. They started to be built around 3,800 BC or around 5,800 years ago. And it was in use for at least 800 years. And where we get this range of dates from is from deer antler that was included in the burial chambers and it had been burnt on the funeral pyres. So that's where we're getting our dates for the age of the monuments from. But what's fascinating about that is deer were extinct in Ireland at the time. We had no native deer in the country. So what we have here in Carrowmore is the oldest, oh, the oldest known remains of red deer that you find in Ireland. So we know that these farmers are coming here 
from the continent. We know that eventually they bring cattle with them, but we know also that they bring red deer to Ireland and to Scotland with them as well, where deer had become extinct. So that's quite fascinating. Now I've moved on down to South Sligo, and this is Carol Keel, uh, one of the monuments in Carol Keel. Sligo has got such just a fascinating landscape. It's, it's, it's utterly amazing um, mountains and, and kind of vistas in Sligo and hills and that's surely one of the reasons why these Stone Age people came here because you tend to find that they built their monuments in places with the most amazing views um, of the landscape. This is one of the cairns in Carol Keel. Well, Carol Keel is in South Sligo and it's, it's a, a mountain range It's kind of formed by glaciers. It's got these kind of glacial valleys um, passing through it and they all point towards the mountains up in North Sligo. This would be one of the more unusual monuments in Carol Keel. It's called Cairn E and it has a kind of a court shaped feature here at the south end and has a passage shaped feature at the north end and that passage points towards Queen Maeve's Cairn on Knock Array about 25 kilometres north of us. Now there are other monuments in Carrow Keel which have never been opened like these photographs were taken by Leo Regan who used to live in Carrow Keel oh, back about 20 or 25 years ago and this is watching the sun setting in a notch on the side of Kesh Corran from the top of one of the unopened monuments. So that's the sequence of photographs here and you can see the sun drops right over that notch. So as I was saying, you don't have to be inside a monument to discover this um, type of astronomy. What, what we're looking at here is not a kind of a modern scientific astronomy. It's much more of a kind of a religious kind of, um, um, a, a natural kind of astronomy uh, where they seem to have been attempting to reconcile the cycles of the sun and the cycles of the moon. And as I mentioned, we know that they're coming here from Brittany. And one of the reasons that you find, I think, such an early interest in this kind of astronomy is basically these people have come to a new land quite a bit north of where they were. So they're trying to work out their own relationship to the land and the landscape through their own use of calendars. So I've never believed that these were farming calendars. There seems to be something more to it. There's some kind of ritual or religious calendars, quite possibly, that are going on um, at these monuments. Um, this is two of the monuments in Carrow Keel. This is Cairn B and over here on the cliffs beyond you can see Cairn F. And so like I was saying at the start, these things are quite like artificial caves. So this is a man-made tunnel leading into this mound of stones and it brings you into a small chamber with this, um, a view out the back and you're looking back towards some of the other mountains. So this is what you find in Carrow Keel. In Carrow Moor you found the circles of stones with the raised platforms and their open burial chambers. Here in Carrow Keel, you find a later stage of these monuments. So instead of freestanding burial chambers, we find the chambers are covered by mounds of stone. They may have been freestanding at some stage in their evolution, but um, when they're completed, they're certainly covered by mounds of stone. So they're like miniature mountains with tunnels or artificial caves leading into them. And you can see here on the right, these are some of the pieces of deer antler and, um, that were found in some of these um, burial chambers. They call them mushroom headed pins or poppy shaped pins as well. And there was quite a lot of pins found uh, in Carrow Keel. Now, I was mentioning in Carrow Moor, uh, generally in the smaller chambers in Carrow Moor, you'd find the remains of possibly 40 to 50 cremated bodies in each monument. And then in the central burial chamber, there were between five and seven bodies. We don't know exactly how many. Here in Carrow Keel, the case is quite different. Um, the monuments were opened in 1911 by Professor McAllister. Um, it was here with a, another archaeologist called Prager. That's McAllister sitting actually sitting on top of this cairn here, which has just been freshly opened back in 1911. But they found a mixture of um, cremated remains and in, uncremated remains um, gathered together in the same chamber, sometimes in different compartments. Now, there are some colleagues of mine who've done a lot of research on uh, the human remains in Carrow Keel. And essentially what happened was at the end of 1911, at the end of their excavations, they, they boxed up all of these human remains and they were transported to the Duckworth, to, uh, they ended up in the Duckworth, Duckworth Laboratory in Cambridge. So that's quite an interesting story, how they tracked down the human remains. They were discovered, I think, again, around 2003. And between 2017 and 2018, there was a, quite a large DNA study done on them. So we got a lot more information about the Stone Age people who built these monuments and these Stone Age farmers. We've moved on now from Ballinahatty when we've a lot more information and a lot of that is coming from Carol Keel. And essentially, if an archaeologist discovers um, a piece of your, 
there's, there's two pieces, two parts of your body which give a lot of information. One of them is your teeth and the enamel on your teeth. And the other is the petrous bone, which is a very small bone, which is in your ear. It's one of the hardest bones in the body. So it's one of the ones that's most likely to survive. And somebody had said it to me, the, the petrous bone is a little bit like the black box of the human body. So if an archaeologist can get their hands on your petrous bone, they can tell what height you were, how many children you had, what kind of diet you had. There's an awful, amount, a huge amount of information um, comes with that. So they got, I think it was five complete human um, genomes from Carol Keel from that project, from the people who had been buried there. So we learned a lot more about them again. I'll tell you a little bit more about them at the end. So there's our gentleman, um, Robert McAllister, when he was here opening up Carroll Keel in 1911. They were looking for gold at the time. Um, McAllister had worked in Palestine, um, the Palestine Excavation Fund, and he kind of, he had a way of working, he, he would have been used to maybe 200 laborers and they would have gone at um, something like termites and they would have worked very hard and very fast. So when he came to Carroll Keel, his, he was a bit rough on the monuments. Um, he, his main interest was in getting inside them and seeing was there any kind of interesting artifacts to be got and there wasn't really um, so he left quite a bit of damage I suppose um, did quite a bit of damage to Carroll Keel anyway while they were down there they were looking for art as well like the, the monuments up at Newgrange the, the famous um, passage grave art and um, they didn't find any but some was discovered um, I think it was in 2009 by our archaeologist Robert Hensey and you can see I've highlighted the designs here these two spirals were discovered just recently inside the back chamber of this monument here at Carroll Keel. Now this is another one of the monuments at Carroll Keel and Carroll Keel has this focus towards the mountains of around Loch Neray and in, around the Ox Mountains and towards midsummer at sunset. So this is one of the monuments in Carroll Keel that McAllister opened in 1911 and the passage didn't go back very far so they went in and they dug in through the roof and they basically quite damaged this monument here but from what you can see, this was me years ago crawling into the passage looking out, and that's the sun coming close to midsummer at Carroll Keel. And just to illustrate that it's quite like a cave again, this is one of the caves here on Loch Neray. So looking out through the passageway of one of these passage graves is very, very similar to being in a cave. You really are in an artificial cave. So in 1997, I was lucky enough to witness this, I suppose, for the first time. Um, one of the monuments in Carroll Keel uh, has an opening over the doorway, which is quite similar to the famous roof box, controversial roof box at Newgrange. And around 1997, we got to see it happening. Um, but the sun basically shines in to this chamber in Carroll Keel over midsummer. Now it takes a little bit of explaining. Um, the, the opening over the doorway is, is right opening into the chamber. So you don't have a long passageway like you'll find at some of the larger, more complex monuments. The sun is shining straight into the, the, the chamber of the monument and as it moves along the horizon so you can see the sun moving along from inside this chamber moving along the horizon for about six weeks and at midsummer it stops at this mountain here which is called Dumour. There is another Stone Age monument on the summit of Dumour. So it's pretty interesting that from this monument quite unlike Newgrange whereas in Newgrange you're looking you have a passageway that focuses on a very specific point on the horizon. Here in Carroll Keel you have an opening that allows you to look at quite a large window of the horizon so you could watch either the sun or the moon as it's setting and on each evening you'll see it moving along the horizon here and it will come to this point, the sun will anyway, and it will stop at this point and return back along the horizon. <coughs> so you can, you have your summer solstice is marked from this monument anyway. It's somewhat controversial because there are quite a lot of archaeologists and archaeoastronomers out there who demand a high degree of precision or maybe a modern scientific precision with these type of monuments. And like I said earlier, they're, they're more of a kind of a ritual, kind of a religious type of a monument. So I don't think you're ever going to find, a, you know, this kind of scientific astronomy here, but you're certainly finding ritual astronomy here. That's what it looks like inside the chamber then. So this is looking the opposite direction from the last monument, or the last um, slide, sorry. And you can see the sunbeam here is trapped over in the left hand recess of the chamber. This is a cruciform chamber. So personally I don't think that they were watching the sun here in Carroll Keel and I've always said that they were actually watching or they were trying to reconcile the cycles of the sun and the moon. So you find there's a grand cycle of the moon. It takes about 18 and a half years to complete and then the moon will come back to the same place on the horizon where it was again. <clears throat> there's, there's a number of cycles like that but basically what seems to be going on here at Carroll Keel is an interest in the sun and the moon in 
tandem, not just one or the other, and quite possibly an interest in predicting eclipses as well, which seems to be a big thing back in the Stone Age. Anyway, that's Carrow Keel and the monuments in Carrow Keel. We're going to hop across the lake here now to Moitura. And Moitura is this beautiful ridge, which is about six kilometers east of Carrow Keel. So you have Carrow Keel on the west hand side of the lake, and Loch Arrow in the middle, and then you've got Moitura on the east. And Moitura is a pretty famous place, um, particularly for mythology. But um, you have, we have four different types of Stone Age monument in Ireland. We have passage tombs, court tombs, portal dolmens, and we have wedge tombs. And you find examples of all these types of monuments on the ridge of Moitura. You also find this amazing piece of mythology. It's the place where the second battle of Moitura takes place in Irish mythology. And in the second battle of Moitura, you have Valor of the Evil Eye, who's this wizard king. He's the leader of the Formorian army. That's um, Jim Fitzpatrick's uh, amazing illustration of him there. And here's another picture from 2080. He's a wizard king from Tory Island. He's got one eye and his eye, his one eye seems to represent the sun. And here you have his grandson, Lou of the Long Arm, Lou Lavada. And Lou was um, hidden from his grandfather. And Balor wanted, there was a prophecy that Balor was going to die by the hand of his grandson. So to make sure it would never happen, he locked his only daughter away in a tower to make sure that he'd never have any grandchildren. And when that didn't work out, he tried to drown the young Lou into a world, in a whirlpool. So he was rescued by Manon and MacLear. There's a huge chunk of mythology there that takes place up on the ridge of Moitura. Anyway, it's the place where Lou has this um, epic meeting with his grandfather. Now, this is the cairn up on the summit of Moitura. It's called Shilu. And Shilu is um, Lou's fairy mound or Lou's mound. And this monument was quite badly damaged. It was dug into by a landlady, I think Lady Louisa Tennyson, who was looking for Lou's skeleton back in the 1870s or so. So there's a big crater in the middle. We don't know what kind of a passageway it had. But if you um, are up on Shilu near midsummer, at sunset, the sun as it sets drops down over Loch Nere. You can see here again about 25 kilometers away, there's Loch Nere Mountain. There's Queen Maeve's Cairn up on the summit. And over on the side here, that's um, a drawing by Jim Fitzpatrick of the arrival of Lou. So Lou is virtually, he's a sun god basically, and Balor is some kind of a sun god as well, his grandfather. That's another picture of the same sunset. Again, you've got the Cairn here called She Lou. You've got Queen Maeve's Cairn up on the summit of the mountain and you have the sun setting at midsummer over here. And the drawing over here on the side again is a picture of Lou, which I found recently in an old book. This drawing or this illustration is actually by Maud Gunn. And um, she was illustrating um, a book by Ella Young uh, on the coming of Lou. So you can see there Lou is a sun god and you've got all these, this halo around him. And that's what you have more or less going on in this image here as well. So as the sun is dropping towards Loch Nere, and this is what happens. When the sun actually hits the mountain, it actually sinks into the cliffs right on the edge of Loch Nere at sunset. Now this is Loch Nere here, Queen Maeve's Cairn on the summit, sorry. Um, Carol Moore would be down here, and then this is the witch's house, and this is the Ballygally Mountain. So this is the goddess in the mountain figure that you can see from South Sligo. And then this here is Ben Bolton, and this here is the Lake of the Eye. So essentially what happens in the Battle of Moitura is that Lou has this confrontation with his grandfather, and in some versions he uses a spear and in some versions he uses a slingshot and he puts out his grandfather's eye. And his grandfather's eye rolls down the hill and forms this lake called Loch Massoon, the lake of the eye. The water quenches the Balor's fiery eye and according to the local tradition, the eye is down at the bottom of that lake. So it's quite an amazing landscape that when you see when the sun sets at midsummer, it drops right behind Loch Nere Mountain and Queen Maeve's Cairn over here. It doesn't drop behind Queen Maeve's Cairn at the moment, but things have shifted slightly since the Stone Age. And back in the Stone Age, it actually would have dropped more closer to here, where the, the, the monument is up on top of the mountain. So that's a hugely mythic landscape here. That's a huge amount of mythology takes place within this landscape. And this mythology has all been recycled in modern times because the same story, I wondered for years, how did these stories get to California and come back as movies? But basically the same story has come back to us from, from Hollywood as, um, Star Wars. Star Wars is a ripoff of Frank Herbert's novel Dune, um, which was from the 1960s, which is basically the same story. Um, it's a story about a, an evil grandfather who has 
as um, he get, his grandson is born somewhere and he's hidden and eventually he comes back and he confronts his grandfather. In the Star Wars version, it's the father, but essentially when you have Lou of the long arm here with his slingshot or his spear and his grandfather, you are looking at Luke Skywalker with his photon torpedo and the exhaust vent of Death Star, Balor's eye basically blowing up. So you can see here how this Irish mythology has traveled quite a bit and come back to us again from um, the west coast of America. Now, just before we leave Loch Arrow, this is a picture of Heapstown Cairn, which is actually one of the biggest um, cairns in the area. It has never been opened. So this is right down uh, between Carrowkeel and Moitura. And this is a photograph that I found probably from the 1930s. And it's just interesting that there's a crossroad dance going on because there is a crossroad just by Heapstown Cairn here. Heapstown is the heap of stone. And in the Battle of Moitura, this is the place where the two of the Danon were healing anybody who was killed or injured in the battle. They were, there was a well here, an enchanted well under this monument. And um, any warrior who was killed or injured would be taken here and dipped into the well and drawn out alive and whole again, which gives you a kind of an indication of the, the kind of symbolism of these monuments. But it's very interesting that it was used as a place for gathering for people to gather and dance. And you can see the gentleman here playing a tune for them on the fiddle as well. So. That's um, a social gathering at Heapstown. Now, that's out of County Sligo, and we're going to move across to um, County Meath. And some of these monuments here uh, are Loch Crew, or this is what I'll be talking about next is Loch Crew. So Loch Crew is another group of passage graves. We have the oldest collection are over in Carrowmore in Sligo, um, almost 6,000 years old, some of them. The ones in Carrowkeel have been more or less dated now from that um, uh, human genetics um, project and we can say the monuments in Carrow Keel date to around 3500 BC. The monuments in Loch Crew have not been dated in modern times. There are about 25 monuments remaining at Loch Crew of at least an original 40 but they would seem to be younger than the monuments in Sligo um, simply because they are larger and more complex and you find a lot of passage grave art or art associated with these monuments. And this is the most famous aspect of these monuments, is the art associated with them. So you can see when we're talking about a cross-shaped chamber, you can see there's current tea, that's a cruciform chamber. So you've got your passageway leading into your central chamber, and then you've got these three recesses off to the side. Um, you've got some with five recesses, and one or two with seven recesses here at Loch Crew as well. And that's a watercolour by uh, Du Neuer, who was, that's from probably about the 1860s, that um, watercolour was done. Now, there's an American researcher called Martin Brennan and his friend Jack Roberts, and they would have been a big inspiration on me back when I got interested in this um, subject. Uh, Martin Brennan wrote a book called The Stars and the Stones, and that prompted me years ago to go and visit um, Loch Crew and investigate some of these monuments where at certain times of the year at sunrise, the beam of sun shines into the monument and lights up the arch. So you can see that happening here. You can see these engraved um, patterns on the sides of the stones here, and you can see the beam of sunlight is shining into our artificial cave or into our chamber. And that's what it looks like looking out the other way. So that's from the end recess of that monument, and that's looking back out the doorway. So this is at Cairn T at Loch Crew. And you can see that's fairly vivid now. That's from a, a, an old film. This is from before digital cameras were knocking around um, from the late 1990s. And that's the panel of light and lighting up that piece of engraved art. So that's the panel that's coming in through the doorway. And then the beam of light is being modeled by the shape of the chamber on the inside. You can see the lintel here, you can see the sill stone, this blocking stone here, and also these sides. So you're seeing a beam of light is basically being modeled by all of these stones around the monument here. And you can see how the beam of light focuses on the top section of this carved stone. And that's a close-up of that stone from around the same time, actually. And you can see these are very solar looking, very, very solar symbol looking um, symbols carved on this stone here. Um, as the sun rises in the sky, um, less of the beam of light is able to get into the monument. So the beam of light basically narrows at the back of the chamber and focuses on this sun design or this sun wheel that you can see here. This is the main sun wheel. And you can also see that there are these kind of measurements or calibrations quite possibly along the top as well. So you can see this beam of light here is, can be used to measure, you can see we're three units down from the top here. So there seems to be something quite sophisticated going on here. Now this monument is lit up by 
the sunrise and the equinoxes. So this happens twice a year. You have the spring equinox and you have the autumn equinox. And the beam of light tends to be bigger on the autumn equinox, twice as long, I think, as on the spring equinox. But there's a lot more study could be done of this, but there's definitely some very, very sophisticated type of astronomy going on here at this, uh, this monument here. And this is the Witches Monument, by the way, the Witches Mountains, uh, Loch Crewe. You find all the same kind of myths as you find at um, Carrow Moor and to a lesser extent at Carrow Keel, but um, Sleeve McCulloch is the Irish name for Loch Crewe, the Witches Mountains or the Witches Hops. And there's an old poem by Jonathan Swift or Dean Swift, and he's talking about the witch who's called Garag Oak, the same as our witch open Sligo. And she has a, a sleigh which is drawn by her deer and she had, flies across the mountains and she builds the monuments um, carrying the rocks in her white apron. This is the largest of the monuments here in La Crew, it's Cairn D. And they've never found the passageway or the chamber inside it. It was dug into back in the um, 1860s. There's a huge trench actually dug through it and the entrance was never found. But you can see this huge block of quartz outside here. And this is a fallen standing stone. You can see the butt of it in the ground there. This was actually a white pillar stone and possibly marked the entrance. The entrance is probably behind that triangular stone here. Um, and this large unopened monument. And this is a sunset on the equinox from the witch's cairn over the other hill. So you find again at equinox, the sun was dropping right behind Cairn D, which is that one I just had in the last picture. That's the same mound looked at from a kilometre away. So again, you can see when I'm standing on top of another monument, the sun, when it rises, it shines in and lights up the art in one monument. When it sets, it drops behind another monument from the same place. So they're very interactive landscapes. There's a lot going on at them. Now, this is the other large um, cairn at Loch Crew, Cairn L, which has got an astronomical alignment. And this is a photograph I found online recently taken by um, William Green, who was um, a photographer who took fantastic pictures of a lot of um, archaeological sites. So this is um, this monument had just been re-roofed because the roof had collapsed by the time it was visited, found first of all in the 1860s. So this photograph is probably from around 1890 and we're looking at a concrete roof, which was probably added around 1880, covering that chamber there of Cairn L. This is the monument from the inside. Again, you have a lot of art carved on the stones here. This is a corbelled chamber, like you'd find in Newgrange. So the stones are built of overlapping corbels, which build up and up over each other. Um, that's a photograph I found of um, that monument from before it was roofed. I found it in one of Wood Martin's books. So you can see it there where the roof had been uh, caved in. And when it was cleared out originally by Conwell and the excavators around 1860, 1865, it was full of all the corbels from the roof were actually um, fallen in and on the floor in here. Um, those are some pictures of it from the inside. That's an engraving from Conwell and that's from his report, which came out, he visited in 1865. So it's around 1870. And, that, and you can see there's a fabulous carving here and a very large stone basin. And there's a very interesting pillar stone here, which has got a nickname possibly given to it by Martin Brennan. It's called the Whispering Stone. Now there are speaking stones as well, um, at, um, close to the village of Oldcastle down outside Loch Crew. So maybe the Whispering Stone and the Speaking Stone are related. But this is a kind of a, a white limestone pillar, which is inside this chamber and it's freestanding inside the chamber as well and is guarding this entrance to this, um, this large recess with the carved design in here. So you can see this is more or less the same view here as you have in Conwell's engraving back from the 1860s. And that is a close-up of the design carved on the stone at the back. Um, you can see there's this very large complex circular symbol here, and it's got this bulge or this flare coming out the side, which has been suggested by quite a few people that this may be an eclipse or a representation of an eclipse. And there's a little carving down here to the right as well. And, and this carving, you actually have the sun's rays coming up. You have a crescent, just like a child would draw the sun. So it's telling you that you were looking at the sunrise here. So it's amazing when you see these um, stones, when there's no sunlight on them, when you see them just in normal daylight, because when you see the power of the sun, when it's shining in on them, it's quite spectacular. Now, again, there's the, this controversial might be considered a little bit alignment, or this alignment might be considered a little bit controversial by some people. But um, I was lucky enough to witness this around 1997, and it happens on the cross-quarter day, which um, roughly, again, when 
the monuments in Carrowmore is being uh, lit up by the sun. Um, the one in Tara as well, the Mount of the Hostages has a similar alignment, but several of them in Loch Crew seem to be pointing towards this um, sunrise, which is around the 5th, 6th or 7th of November. And when the sun rises, it comes up over a hill outside the door of this monument called the Red Mountain or Shalib Rua, or Carrick the Speckled Mountain. And the beam of sunlight flashes in, and this is what's so spectacular, is it hits the top of the Whispering Stone, the Standing Stone, this is the first thing to be lit by this beam of light. Then the beam of light slides off the Whispering Stone and you can see it here on the right on the panel of stone in the recess. And that's the shape of the doorway here you can see on the left and that beam of light is lighting up that engraved panel in the back. So I'm just going to go back again. Just There's no difference, there's no comparison, sorry, between seeing the stone um, with your naked eye at any time and seeing it when it's actually lit up on the morning. When this is obviously how the stone is meant to be viewed, I suppose, you know. That's just a close up of it again. So the beam of light moves from the whispering stone down onto this panel at the back, and then it moves over onto this stone on the side, and then it starts to break up and the light leaves the chamber. So again, you can see the beam of light has gone from the top of the whispering stone here, and then it's moved around and it's gone across this panel, and here it's broken up and the recess has gone back into darkness again. So that's quite a spectacular alignment. So again, there would be different opinions about its veracity or whatever, but the Stone Age people built these monuments and the sun shines into them at certain times. These things do, you know, um, they happen. So um, just quickly and finish up here, just a few pictures from the Boyne Valley. I haven't done a whole lot about the Boyne Valley because I wouldn't have witnessed too many things up there myself. And also some of the, the larger mounds, um, like Nouth, for example, you can't see the sun shining into anymore because of modern works. But this is here is at Douth. And this is an old picture of a stone called the Stone of the Seven Suns. And there are these engravings and there are seven of them on this stone here. And again, Martin Brennan probably um, gave this stone uh, the, the name, the Stone of the Seven Suns. But there has been some interesting research been done recently, and there's a gentleman, Robin Edgar, I know if you're out there, and he identifies these as basically um, illustrations of solar eclipses, and he has a very convincing argument. If you put one of these diagrams here beside a Victorian, uh, early Victorian picture of a solar eclipse, you definitely seem to be looking at eclipses here. Hello to Ken Williams as well. I see you out there. Ken, I borrowed one of your pictures just to show the shadows um, shining outside Newgrange here. So Ken is a photographer has a great website called Shadows and Stones. And um, that's just a great picture of Newgrange here, just giving it an idea of the size of the mound itself, 90 meters in diameter. You've got your stone circle running around the outside, 12 stones remaining of, we don't know how many were there originally, but the point about it is that these stones, especially the ones at the entrance, interact by casting shadows with some of the other stones as well. Again, there's controversy about the age of the, 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 the stone circle around Newgrange. It's thought to be possibly up to a thousand years younger than the passage grave itself. And here you have the um, roof box and the entrance over the entrance stone into the mound. So anyway, great picture there by Ken Williams. Those are two pictures of what happens inside Newgrange. So that's the most famous of all of these um, alignments that you'll find in Ireland. That's the entryway into Newgrange and that's the opening of the doorway, the roof box. And again, there's a bit of controversy about that, something that everybody is happy that it's, it's an original fixture or whatever. But it's pretty much doing, it seems to be working pretty well anyway. But what always struck me is that this is basically what you find in Carrow Keel as well. You find this opening over the doorway and you find the doorway and you find the beam of sunlight shining in and penetrating. In the case of Newgrange here, the beam of light is about 22 meters long and gets from the entrance right into the back of the chamber here. Those are two pictures from Michael O'Kelly's book. Um, this is just a picture I found while I was putting this talk together. That's just one of the problems they had for many, many years at Newgrange was graffiti. Um, I was recently reading an interview with Mrs. Hickey, who was the caretaker of Newgrange, and um, she was tortured um, trying to stop people graffitiing. So when you do go into some of these monuments, you'll see graffiti going back, in the case of Newgrange, probably going back to 1799 when Newgrange was opened. So that's one of the stones in the passageway. It's um, this grey wacky, which is almost like skin, and it's actually quite easy to score with a nail or with something hard. So the carvings would not have been incredibly hard to do on some of these stones, possibly. This is Nouth, to finish up. Nouth is the largest of all of these monuments. It seems to be larger than Newgrange again, and it has two passages, one on the east side and one on the west side. And a huge array of carved stones running around the base, these, these curb stones. You have these um, tall um, 
quite phallic standing stone here and a round, more feminine stone here. You have these stone settings and you have these exotic boulders. Now we can't tell anymore what the alignment is at Nouth because there's been, there was a lot of damage done to the entrances of the monuments, but it's aligned roughly towards equinoxes, um, sunrise and sunset. It's about seven days off on one side, and I think maybe 12 days off on the other side. But I believe myself this may be to do with the fact that they were trying to reconcile the, the, um, the, this, the cycles of the sun and the moon. And I have this notion, I've always had it at Nouth, that at, at some stage when Nouth was functioning properly, that you've had the sun rising um, uh, shining into the eastern chamber possibly at sunrise while the full moon was setting into the other chamber at the other side. I just have a notion that that's possibly something that was going on at these monuments or part of the design of these monuments. I don't know for sure, but we can't say for, um, we can't say for now anyway because um, the entrances were quite damaged back in the early Christian times. Anyway, that's a photograph from Frank Pendergast there just showing how the sun does come into alignment at Nouth and that's that standing stone you can just see here. And these stones also cast shadows and the shadows are projected onto the curb stones outside the moment. Um, just to finish off, that's the Chamber of Nouth and there's no public access to this monument because again, there was quite a bit of damage inside the monument from over the years from stone settling. You can see there's a fairly big crack in that corbel there. Um, the whole thing is kind of skewed so the passageway leading into the last maybe 12 feet getting into this passage, you have to crawl on your belly to get in. So there's no public access to it. But the ceiling is possibly even more complex than new ranges. Again, I think it's possibly just slightly higher, but that's um, the corbel ceiling, which is um, in Nouth. And that's my last slide. That's the Great Basin in Nouth. So again, talk back to talking about symbolism and symbolism of eclipses and various different things. But this basin is, it, it rivals the entrance stone at Newgrange for excellence of carving and design. You've got these seven bands um, running around the outside. You've got this large concave or this, this hollow in the center. And then you've got this panel of a design on the front. And you've got these amazing carvings around the side as well. One of the things that has always fascinated me about this basin is that it was too large to have been added to the monument afterwards. So this chamber has to have been built around this basin. So it was carved in situ and then the, the monument itself has to have been built around it. So you have this amazing symbol here on the outside, not unlike the one that was I had a slide of a few minutes ago at Loch Crew, but you seem to have something like an orbit. You know, it seems to be orbits and you have something smaller circle here orbiting around a bigger circle. And then for the design inside the monument as well, a circle at the center, there's six rays, six on each side coming out of that, like flares from the sun. And then there's this, another circle here, and then there's hoops coming out of that. So you have what would seem to me to be a very graphic description of a solar eclipse. Okay, I think I've just come to the end of my talk. I have. So. Now, are you there, Liam? I am, and thank you. You're Thank welcome. you, Martin. That was absolutely fascinating. I have some uh, uh, hugely complimentary comments here on the chat that I'm going to send down to you. Uh, I want to hear from uh, Anne Caroline, who is originally from Germany. Uh, she's a great historian here, uh, close to where I live in Kenny. And she's wondering how many people would have been involved in some of the constructions of the monuments up in Sligo. Um. The small, the, the one of the things you find with the monuments is the smaller monuments are the older ones, and that's when there would have been less people um, knocking around. So the smaller monuments, like the ones in Carrowmore, possibly you could have been talking about a couple of, you know, 10, 15 people over a week or two, not, not a huge amount of work. The bigger monuments like Newgrange and Queen Maeve's Cairn, you're talking about seasonal work going on for a number of years with a lot of people, I would imagine. Okay, that's great. Thanks, Martin. And you mentioned that some of the unopened cairns um, are obviously still unopened. Are there any plans in the future to excavate those? No, I don't think there are. And um, they're, they're, I don't think there probably should be either because we have so many of them open in the country. And Sligo actually has about 10, or the west coast of Ireland has about 10 of the largest ones left in Western Europe that have never been opened. But um, it's probably no harm that they are there. That's what you would be told these days is they're being kept in a future reference. And we also, I know this from working for the OPW, they actually have more 
things than they can cope with at the moment. So no, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't see it any time in the future. There's also a lot of damage being done to some of those monuments, like Queen Maeve's Cairn on Knocknaray has been, especially with the White Atlantic Way in the last few years, has been receiving huge amounts of visitors. So, you know, there's there's going to have to be some kind of protection, I think, um, going to happen to be given to them because there's a huge interest in this subject and a huge amount of visitors visiting them, but um, they're actually quite unprotected. The ones in Carrochiel as well will be quite fragile. So no plans anyway that I know of, no. Plans to fence them, possibly. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Martin. That leads on nicely to my next question, which is, the early uh, excavation work and the early work to, uh, I suppose, um, expose these monuments, what sort of damage did it actually create uh, way back in the late 1800s, early 1900s? Um, the main damage, I suppose, you see nowadays when, when, an ar when, when archaeologists are looking at some of these monuments, what they would really like to be getting their hands on would be unburnt bone material because that's now everything has gone genetics or a DNA, as they would call it, whereas when we would be looking at Roger Walker digging in Carol Moore, looking for gold, he had no interest in the human remains, and they were generally chucked outside the monuments and out around the monuments, so they had no interest in things which would be the most valuable possibly now um, for um, figuring out some of this stuff. But just in general, say, in Carol Keel, they didn't do a huge amount of damage, but if something was in their way, they would have got a sledgehammer and smashed it. I know they smashed the, yeah. the roof flag of the largest monument because it was in their way, they tunneled into the roof of another monument because um, they couldn't get into the chamber. At Loch Crew, they tunneled their way through the biggest monument and, and just left a crater in the middle of it. So they were, Douth as well was also quite damaged in the 1840s. So they, they generally didn't um, treat the monuments too well. Great, thanks Martin. I have one here from uh, Gerard Mullally, a neighbour of mine here in uh, Kelvin to Kenny. Um, and he's asking, is there uh, anything that can be done with modern technology to get an insight into the plan of the unopened monuments? Not that I know of, again, because they have ground, penetra they have ground penetra penetrating radar and they have different things, but I don't know if that works on stone the same way with, with piles of stone um, as, as it does on earth. I know with, with earth, you can pick up different resistivity, but I, I think they would have done it possibly on the big stone cairns if they could have done. Also, I think it's pretty expensive. It's, it's kind of like um, archaeology now in Ireland tends to be more for research projects or things like that. There's not any of these really big digs. There's not, that kind of archaeology is not really being done so much anymore. Um, but no, I don't think so anyway. I don't think that they can tell what's inside those big unopened mounds. And this is a question from my side. So thank you so much, Martin. You've been very accommodating. Um, what about the intersection between pre-Christian times and Christian times, and were those sites used um, uh, as Christian sites at, at later dates? Um, yes, to a certain extent, like some of the monuments, like for example, Shimur in Leitrim has a big Christian cross up on top of it, which is lit up at night. So they were used in some places, they were re-Christianized. Um, there's, there's a few of them actually. There's, a, there's, a, there's an amazing monument in Sligo town called the Abbey Quarterstone Circle. And that was also Christianized back in the 1950s. Um, some of them are supposed to have been used um, for burying uh, unbaptized children, but I don't know if that's strictly true or not. There's, there's kind of stories about that around Carol Keel and that, but I don't think so. But not so much. You will find, say, for example, in France, you know, um, putting a cross up on top of a monument or building a church on top of a monument would be mainly how they would have been used in later times. There are crosses on some of the um, the monuments at Loch Crew as well, maybe from, um, they could be surveyors' marks or they could be people trying to Christianize the monuments, being, seeing them as pagan monuments. Great, thanks a million, Martin. And I think we'll leave You're it welcome. there with a couple of other questions. Um, I, 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 I can uh, send answers back to the people privately. Uh, you've done a magnificent job, uh, Thank you very as much. always. Thank you very much, really enjoyed it. Uh, just to give people a feel for what's coming up next, uh, Tomorrow evening at 8 o'clock, we have a very timely reminder of the 1916 executions. So Marcus Howard is back interviewing Derek Molyneux to talk about the people who died uh, post-1916, 104 years ago, uh, this week, most of them. Uh, on Friday, we've got Eddie Lennon, uh, the famous storyteller uh, from Clare. Uh, he's going to get a big audience, so dial in early. 
Um, and on Saturday, we have a very important event, which is, as probably a lot of you know, all of our commemorations um, around 1920 have been cancelled. Uh, one of them hasn't, and it's the commemoration of the barracks attack um, in uh, Tipperary. So uh, Hollyford, Weir Cross, and Drangan. Uh, that's going ahead, virtual commemoration at half past seven on Saturday. Uh, so I hope you all get tune in for that. So I'm just going to hopefully be able to unmute you all and you can just um, give a big bully boss there for uh, Martin for a fantastic lecture. So much, Martin. Thank you. Thanks, Martin. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, welcome. Thank you. All done. Okay, Liam. See you again. See you in a couple of weeks, Martin. All right. Cheers. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Bye.